Hamilton, and we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure people will be signing on, you know, after we get started, but um, again, we don't have that much time, so we need to take advantage of all the time we have. I'm excited. I think we'll have a lot of good, uh, good conversation yeah. around this today, so thank you, everybody. Yes. Well, I have five o'clock, so I think it's we need to go ahead and uh, get started. So welcome everybody that's joining us today for a panel discussion um, titled, Are We in a Race Against Time? COVID Vaccines and SARS-CoV-2 Variants. The panel discussion today is hosted by the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs from the Bush School of Government and Service, the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, the Office of the Vice President for Research, and the Texas A&M Emergency Management Advisory Group. My name is Dr. Jerry Parker, and I am the Associate Dean for Global One Health at the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. We first want to thank all of you for joining us today for this discussion, and we have to plan, plan to have more discussions in the future on COVID-19 and public health preparedness as we incorporate lessons observed come for come from COVID-19 to lessons learned for future emerging infectious diseases with pandemic potential. For today, we have arranged a timely discussion around COVID vaccines and SARS-CoV-2 variants. And to explore the question, are we in a race against time against variants? We will also introduce a topic that has not received much attention and that is animal vaccines for coronaviruses. I think we're all gonna be learning a lot from that discussion. And I'm not sure exactly how this discussion will go today and how our panelists will answer the question, but I do know we are very fortunate to have leading experts assembled for a rational discussion so that we can explore this question in a proper context of what we know from the data today and how we have better systems in place so that we can hopefully stay in front of SARS-CoV-2. We will see. So let me begin the introductions. Uh, I will introduce our moderator and the panelists, but I'm going, only going to give very brief introductions. Please take the time to read their bios that are either linked or listed on the Scopecroft webpage for this event. I think you will share with my enthusiasm, particularly after you read their bios and even just their, their positions um, uh, right now in the fight against COVID, we have an all-star lineup today. So first, our moderator, Dr. Allison Fick, who I've had the honor of working with, particularly supporting the, the Texas A&M Emergency Management Advisory Group um, since COVID began. And it's really impressive for everybody, particularly the Texans, you need to be very proud of our institutions of higher education. They've really um, come, come to help and support our colleagues at the uh, Department of State Health Services, Texas Division of Emergency Management, and, and others, and even our own universities and, and helping on the continuity of operations to continue our education, service, and research missions. It's really impressive what the, uh, our institutions of higher education have brought to bear in the fight against COVID-19. But back to our moderator introduction, that Dr. Fick, she is the Senior Associate Vice President for Research and a Regents Professor and Director of the Center for Microencapsulation and Drug Delivery College at the College of Medicine. Dr. Fick will serve as our overall moderator, but I know I'm not gonna be able to resist the urge to jump in occasionally myself, because this is a very exciting topic. Our panelists include first, Dr. Jennifer Schufert. She is the Chief State Epidemiologist at the Texas Department of State Health Services. Second, Dr. Benjamin Newman. He is Professor of Biology, Chief Virologist for the Global Health Research Complex, Texas A&M University. Third, Dr. Alan Barrett. He is a director for the Seeley Institute for Vaccine Sciences, University of Texas Medical Branch, Galveston, Texas. And fourth, Dr. Mahesh Kumar, the Senior Vice President, Global Biologics Research and Development, Zoetis Incorporated. Again, we are very fortunate to have such a distinguished panel. 
and all of them have been deep in the fight against SARS-CoV-2. Just a little housekeeping before we start so that you know what to expect in this discussion. The panelists will be given an opportunity to provide opening comments that will be prompted by a question from Dr. Fick. After opening remarks by the panelists, we will have a moderated discussion with the panelists that will be followed by a Q&A from you. We have received many questions in advance, so if, but if you didn't submit a question in advance, if you have a question during the discussions, please type in your question into the chat. We will try our best to answer as many questions as possible, but I know that because of all the questions we received in advance, there's just not gonna be enough time to do that. But what we will uh, try to do is uh, post uh, answers to um, some of the questions, as many as we can on the website, in, uh, from the Scowcroft website in the coming days. So our, anyway, our, our, our intent is to provide information and knowledge that's actionable to, to everyone here, whether you're in the public, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a policymaker. So Dr. Fick, with that introduction and a little bit of house cleaning, I, I keeping, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started, Dr. Fick. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parker. I uh, would like to begin this afternoon with uh, Dr. Shuford and it's a welcome and thank you for joining us uh, in this panel. Uh, in your position as state epidemiologist, you have a unique view of the emerging variants. And we'd like to ask why are these SARS-CoV-2 variants important to the public health system in Texas? So, <laughs> Why are variants important to public health? I, let me give you a few reasons, but I'll, I'll take a step back first and just say viruses constantly change. Uh, we know that it's to be expected. Um, and this does result in new variants of a virus occurring over time. And sometimes these viruses or these variants emerge and then disappear. Sometimes they increase in prevalence. Um, and those are the ones that are worrisome. And DSHS has been following multiple variants of SARS-CoV-2 during this pandemic. So exactly why would these be of concern to us if we expect them? Well, so variants have the potential of, um, of acquiring different characteristics and variants may have increased transmissibility. Um, they can have uh, greater or cause greater severity of illness. They, there's the potential that they can escape detection by currently available viral tests or evade immune response from prior infection or from prior vaccination, or, e or not respond to FDA authorized therapeutics. And because it's the job of public health to help limit the spread of infectious diseases through the population, these potential changes in um, the variants worry us a lot. And for instance, greater transmissibility will, re will result in larger outbreaks and the need for more stringent public health measures to help control the spread of the disease. It also impacts the, the herd immunity threshold value. Transmissibility is the key factor to determining what level of immunity in the population is required to reach herd immunity. Failure of diagnostic tests will allow for outbreaks to go undetected um, and it decrease the capacity for antibodies to work, whether it's from previous infection or previous vaccine, it also impacts our ability to kind of let up on those public health interventions, which everyone is dying to do right now. So if natural infection and vaccination do not provide effective immune response, then everyone in the population remains susceptible, increasing the need for ongoing mitigation activities um, by the entire population. So this kind of leads me to like what is the variant situation in US and Texas and is there cause for concern? Can you go to the next slide? And so this is um, a slide from, it's an image from CDC, but it shows variants that are circulating in the United States in two week intervals. You can see all the way over on the left, it's uh, January, so the first two weeks in January and it progresses all the way until the end of March. Um, and what you can see is that some of these variants have stayed about the same and some have increased and some have decreased. But what you definitely see is that B117, that UK variant has steadily increased in the United States um, since January. And the most recent interval shows that B117 accounts for about 45% of all variants. Uh, and this was in March. So that was three to four weeks ago. Um, I guess more four weeks ago. 
So we can anticipate that B117 probably makes up more than 50% of SARS-CoV-2 infections in the United States at this point. But you can see that the prevalence of B1429, which is one of the California variants, hasn't really changed much overall. And that the other variants of concern, like that P1, the um, Brazil variant, is only at 1.5%. And B1351, which is the South Africa variant, is actually less than 1%. All right, next slide. So this also comes from CDC website, um, and they give state-specific estimates based on a statistically weighted sample of SARS-CoV-2 specimens. And you can see Texas here. I've outlined it in the red box. Um, and so these are numbers from a four-week interval that occurred during March. And you can see that about 45% of Texas SARS-CoV-2 viruses at that point were B117, the UK variant. And, and this just is a good reflection of what's going on across the United States. However, if you look at Texas, um, other, the, the levels of other variants of concern, so B1429 and 427, we had about 8% here in Texas versus about 10% in the entire United States. Um, and, and that's drastically different. You can kind of see up at the top of that slide, Arizona and California. And so our prevalence of those here in Texas is drastically different than what they're seeing in California and Arizona. Texas also has lower levels of P1 and B1351 than um, is seen on average in the rest of the United States. All right, go to the next slide, please. So this is what our variant cases look like in Texas. Um, now we have a different sampling and reporting system here. So this chart just shows the number of cases reported to DSHS um, that involve one of the variants of concern. And the reports are broken down by trauma service area or TSA. Um, and that map over on the right, it's, it's kind of small, I recognize that, but it shows the location of the different trauma service areas that, um, that the uh, left-hand column is referring to. And, and what you can see is that this table shows that cases of these variants have been found across the state of Texas, but there are certainly areas where the cases seem to occur more frequently. So if you look there at TSAE, that's the Dallas area and TSAQ, that's the Houston area. So they have a lot more reported cases of um, these, these variants of concern. And these are our larger population centers and they have more dense populations. So it's possible that these variants are more prevalent in these populations, but it also seems very likely that this is just sampling bias. That, um, that is that they're getting reported from these communities because those are the places that have the capacity to do sequencing, especially sequencing in large number. So as you can see from the numbers though, um, that are totaled along that bottom row, that um, B117, the UK variant, makes up the majority of our variant cases here in Texas, about 90% actually. Um, the California variants make up about 9%. Uh, that's that B1429 and B1427. And then if you look at P1 and B1351, the Brazil and South Africa variant, we just have a handful of each of those. I guess it's right around 10 and 11 cases of those. Um, but what isn't shown on this table and that I really want to emphasize is that very few of these cases are travel related. Like we refer to them as the UK variant or the California variant since that's where they were first identified. But these infections are incur occurring in Texas in people who have not traveled. So it's very plain to us that these are circulating in communities across Texas. It's also clear to us that Texas has a huge population with a lot of new COVID-19 cases every day that get reported to our, our state public health department. So we are also at risk of having variants emerge here. And I think you probably saw the media report about Dr. Newman's sequence finding in a Texas A&M student. I don't know if he's gonna to touch on that, but we certainly know that that can happen here in Texas. And because of this, um, DSHS is, um, DSHS, I'm sorry, is Department of State Health Services. That's the state health department. But DSHS is currently prioritizing our sequencing surveillance in Texas. We're increasing our efforts to sequence the variants in our own, um, here at our own state uh, public health lab. But we're also trying to really prioritize our efforts at, at um, getting reporting, collecting sequencing results from across the state. There's a lot of sequencing going on out there that can provide a better picture of what's going on in communities across Texas. So we're working on a unified way of collecting those data. 
And this is gonna give us a better view of newly emerging and currently circulating variants. However, I did wanna mention um, that, you know, the current situation with the vi variants have prompted us to really focus on our vaccination efforts. So we know that mutations emerge when the virus infects a person and that virus is allowed to replicate. And by preventing infection, this can help prevent the emergence of some new variants. Also, um, at this point in time, you can see from this table that the most common variant in the, in the United States and in Texas is that B117 variant. And authorized vaccines appear to have retained a lot of effectiveness against this variant. I think uh, somebody else is gonna talk about this uh, in a lot, much more informed manner, but, but you know, this is an opportunity because um, that sort of vaccine efficacy is probably not gonna be true of all variants. And so now is the time for Texans to get vaccinated. All right, and that those are, are really my concluding remarks, just that these are the, the variants that are circulating right now in Texas at these levels and that we are focused on improving our, our sequence surveillance and really increasing vac vaccination across all age groups um, and populations here in Texas. And thank you, Dr. Shuford, for that uh, great in-depth view of what's going on with the variants in Texas and then that deep dive into data. So. I think that'll be a big topic later on in our discussions. Um, let's move on to uh, Dr. Newman. Uh, as a virologist that's working directly with the COVID samples uh, in real time, what do we mean by the term variant? And where do these come from? Why do we see some variants and we don't see others? Happy to try to answer these very big questions. Thank you for asking those. Um, so what we've got here, and first of all, let's just say that uh, what Dr. Shuford was saying is absolutely the case. If you stop cases, you stop variants from developing. But I'd like to show you where and how these variants are developing. So this little graph at the top, this is showing the entire coronavirus genome from beginning to end. And each of the little blocks is one of the pieces of it. Each of the little bars on top is showing you what percent of the viruses that you would pick up off the street are going to be different at that particular spot. And so I think it's nice for pointing out areas where the virus is changing a lot as opposed to changing just a little bit. So if you look down this thing, there are a couple areas with a lot of change. The big area is this one, the blue box that says S for spike. And then you got other little islands of change down here at the beginning of the N box and uh, Right in here is a thing called open reading frame eight, and that thing gets broken up in just about every strain you would find. But the spike we think is maybe extra important because this is what actually starts off the infection. And there are a couple different zones on the spike. So underneath this, we've got a second little graph, which is zooming in on just the spike. So you can see each little spot along the spike that could change. And you see that not every bit is changing. What you get is some change up near the front end. Now this forms a little bump that sticks out at the side. It kind of looks like a knee sticking out of the side of the spike. This is a spot where lots of antibodies combined, but where the antibodies aren't really going to do a lot more than just stick to it. And um, I don't know, it's like if you're trying to walk down a hall with a bunch of little kids stuck to your legs, it'll slow the virus down, but probably won't do a whole lot more than that. Uh, uh, the other ones I think are more interesting though. Uh, so the second box along here, this is the actual little pad. It's a little tiny surface. It's um, maybe about 5% of the virus. And this is where the virus is going to make direct contact with the human cell. So this is the point of contact. This is the danger zone, if you like. And we see a lot of change in this particular zone. There are right now just certain kinds of changes which are really common, but uh, like this very tall bar, this is a change that you find in the UK variant, for example, and all these other things, uh, some are the ones you would find in the California variants, uh, et cetera. This is the whole world's data that we're looking at. These would have two potential effects. They could change how the virus is able to stick to the cell, make it better or worse, and they could also change the way that we are able to fight back against it. So one of the goals of immunization, but not the only goal, is to make a thing called a neutralizing antibody, which is just a little sticky thing that binds to this exact region in the little box here. All right, going down, the spike actually has to get activated two times by two separate uh, events inside the cell. 
So the spike actually needs a lot of help from you in order to start an infection, which is terrible when you think about it. Yeah. Um, we see a lot of change around the first one. It's a thing called the furin cleavage site. And so this is like activation step number one. It doesn't have to be there. Lots of spikes of coronaviruses don't have a furin cleavage site and they're just fine. But what we see is mutation to make the furin cleavage site bigger. And that's something you also see in avian influenza or bird flu for regular people. And usually when you get changes like this in bird flu, you get a more dangerous one that's able to spread more and grow a little faster. We don't know for sure that this is gonna be the case with the coronavirus, but this is how it's changing. So the virus is being selected uh, just through natural selection and this is what's coming out. Second cleavage site is this thing called Tempress 2 is how you pronounce those terrible letters. That's not changing at all. That's actually the more important site. And it looks as though the virus cannot mess with this and still be alive. So maybe that's good news. Uh, this sort of analysis spots the things the virus can change and the ones that it can't. Last thing down here, this is kind of a put question marks up by it in your mind. There's a region down near the tail that has to unfold and refold. Uh, the virus is actually going to do something a lot like fishing. It's got a little piece uh, in the temperous 2 cleavage area that forms a little hook. And it's going to hook the cell it's trying to get in. And then the sensor region down at the bottom is actually going to basically reel in the fishing hook and see if the virus caught a big one. Yeah. We do see the sorts of changes here that could make the virus a little bit better able to do this or able to go in through a different method. Uh, next slide, please. All right, here are the ones that Dr. <coughs> Shuford was alluding to earlier. These are uh, some of the interesting strains we got on campus and some of the rest of the strains we have on campus. Just like you would expect, about 60% of what we're finding is the UK B117 variant but we've got some interesting local things here too. And I think that's just because we weren't sequencing here. It's, um, yeah, just a case of uh, sort of bias where you look the most, you find the most, and now we're finally looking. The other thing I would say about this graph, so we have all these nice brightly colored groups. Each group is a different lineage, or you could think of it as a strain or a group. Each of them is more than one virus. So none of these variants is just one thing. It's always a cluster of genetically related things. And the other thing I would take away from this is that pretty much anything you pick up out there. So we're going from zero mutations in the center out to a little over 40 mutations if we're beyond the outside ring. The things that you would pick up now tend to fall between about 20 and 45 mutations per genome compared to the original uh, version of the virus that we first saw in late 2019. So this is how far the virus is moving and it is just a function of time. At the beginning of this, the predictions were that this would move at the rate of about 30 mutations per year that would stick in the genome. And just like a little clock, this thing is keeping excellent time. So I think this informs the idea that we are in a race against time. And um, last slide, please. Okay, last thing, we won't even show the top. The top is looking at some of those lineages and the ones that are coming up and going down. It's showing exactly the same thing over time as we saw on the previous slides. But at the bottom, I think this is interesting. So viruses are out there competing against each other and the prize is your lungs, yeah. So there are different strains. Some of these are more competitive. Some of these are little tiny Olympic champions. Yeah, in the world's most terrible Olympics. Um, and there are actually tests that you can do in the laboratory where you do a little competition to try to predict what's going on out there. So we think this is probably what's driving certain types of mutations. The virus changes randomly. And when people ask me, are these viruses really smart? They sure seem smart. The answer is no, they are the opposite. Because to do one correct change, the virus actually has to do every possible incorrect change and then let all of those offspring die. Yeah, it's the worst, uh, most convoluted decision-making process you could possibly imagine. But because the virus has so many offspring and because you only need one virus to get through from a brood of 10,000, that's how you see it constantly moving, constantly changing, and basically working its way up the slope. A virus that leaves more progeny is the virus that is going to win out over the ones that don't. So that's the end of my opening remarks. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Newman, uh, for leading us through the mechanics of this variant emergence as we try and figure out what's on the horizon here, what's, what's going to emerge next uh, uh, along the, uh, the pathway here. And uh, I'd like to move to uh, Dr. Barrett next. Um, uh, Dr. Barrett, as an expert bringing vaccines into practice, can you tell us about the current vaccines? Uh, for example, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Janssen vaccines, are they protecting against all the variants in the US? Are there new vaccines for variants uh, that are coming into clinical trials? Thank you, Alison. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. It's really gonna be very enjoyable, I think. Um, I have no slides. I don't think I'm, I'm quite pleased. I think I could have followed Ben's slides there with uh, anything that. And of course, Julie stole my thunder by saying the vaccine works against the UK variant. So I'm, I'm going to try and go back and, and tell people where we are uh, and then move forward and talk about the variants and, and the problems related to those. So when, when um, the virus first arrived, we had sequence data that came out, as, as Ben said, in uh, late 2019, early 2020. And vaccine development started even before we had the virus. People had the genetic sequence of the spike protein, and they started to put it in all sorts of vaccine candidates to try and get the vaccines um, down the pipeline that could be given to people. And there's been over 300 different vaccine candidates that have been uh, developed so far, and 87 of those have gone into clinical trials. And of those 87, currently 14 are approved or licensed around the world. I would call that tremendous progress in one year in what we've achieved. But let's try and put it into perspective in terms of the variants and the problems we have. When we first started making vaccines, the FDA came out with um, an advisory on what it wanted to see from vaccine developers to approve a vaccine. And this happens with every vaccine, it's not just with, with, with COVID. And they wanted to see vaccine efficacy of at least 50% with the vaccine candidates. And what they were looking for there was to see clinical trials undertaken with a placebo arm. That is to say, half the people would receive the vaccine and half the people would not get the vaccine. They would get um, sugar or something else given to them instead. And the reason for doing that was to find out how many cases of COVID would be seen in the placebo group versus the vaccine. And the vaccine was expected to have at least half the number of cases seen in the placebo group. And um, as we all know, um, in late 2020, uh, both Pfizer and Moderna gave very exciting data and very surprising data, I should say, that they had 95% efficacy um, for both of their vaccines. And so based on this data, the FDA made what's called an emergency youth authorization, which essentially means that vaccines are going to be used because they offer a benefit. There's not enough data to license it because we haven't got the time to do all the studies, but there's a clear benefit for everybody. And so those vaccines move forward. But it's important to understand that's all based on clinical data. And the vaccines that were made in early 2020 were based on the original Wuhan strain. We didn't have the variants then. And all the data we had based on the emergency youth authorization was based on this assumption that everything is the Wuhan strain. But of course, things changed as we move forward to the end of 2020 into 2021. The virus variants um, came along and they caused us great problems, as we all know. And this has really changed the way in which we do clinical trials now. Because everybody who participates in a clinical trial, anyone gets any disease, the virus in them is sequenced, just as Ben talked about, to find out which variant it is. And also, we look for the antibodies made by the vaccinees and how they respond against the different variants. Now, we call these neutralization assays, where essentially we bleed vaccinees, we take the antibodies from their blood, and we ask the question, do they neutralize or kill the virus? And this is done against different variants. Now, this may sound very straightforward, but it's not, because we have eight different assays for neutralization, and the eight assays give you eight different answers. And so it's complicated um, to try and actually analyze the data. But 
Um, it is now recently, WHO, World Health Organization, have now got a standardized antibody that they hope will be able to standardize the assays so that each of the vaccines can be compared to each other so that we can know how the, each vaccine works against each different variants. Now, it's clear from the neutralization data that the UK variant is neutralized very efficient by the antibodies against the vaccines based on the Wuhan strain. Whereas the <laughs> other strains don't tend, variants don't tend to be neutralized that well. But how well is really a very difficult question to answer. Because in terms of vaccinology, we talk about a correlate of protection. We normally believe that's neutralizing antibodies for most vaccines. And if we have a certain antibody teta of neutralizing antibodies, we say you're protected. We anoint you as being protective. And unfortunately, we don't know what that antibody teta is going to be, the quantity, nor do we know at the moment if neutralizing antibodies are going to be the coral protection. We assume yes. If it's no, it's going to be a lot of trouble for everybody. Um, but we hope the answer is going to be yes. Now, as we move forward, um, there's been the clinical trials are done in multiple countries at the same time. It's not just in the United States. And so, for example, the Pfizer study involved 152 sites in six countries. And so this gives you an opportunity when you do the clinical trials to actually investigate whether the vaccines work against different virus variants found in different countries. And it's based on that data because studies were done in the United Kingdom, which elegantly showed that the UK variant did not cause disease in people given the Wuhan vaccine. Now, there are these, as I said earlier, 14 vaccines approved around the world. But of those 14 vaccines, only four have data showing their reactivity and ability to actually uh, protect against different variants. And those are the Pfizer, Janssen, Novavax, and AstraZeneca. And as much as we have great data for the UK variant, when it comes to the South Africa variant, which Julie talked about earlier, this uh, B1.351, the data gets a little bit more worrying, in some cases, very worrying. So the Pfizer vaccine protected 100% of volunteers against the South Africa variant. The Janssen vaccine only protected 57%. Novavax was 55.4%, but AstraZeneca was only 10.4%. So you can see the different vaccines work differently against different variants. And that's not too surprising because they're all based on this Wuhan strain. There's, even though I gave you those very accurate figures, you have to be careful how you interpret them because they're based on very small clinical trials involving between one and 2,000 people. And yet we're trying to extrapolate results to the whole population of the world. And so we have to be very careful. So although I've given you those figures, they represent a very small number of people. And we need to do bigger trials to find out what the true figures are. The biggest question I have, I think, at the moment in terms of the variants is what's the Brazil variant going to do? We know very little about how vaccine efficacy is against Brazil. If you believe the media, it's not very good, but we've got very little scientific data that's come out so far indicating how good the vaccines are. And the vaccines that have been used in Brazil so far are only um, Coronavac, which is an activated Chinese vaccine, and AstraZeneca vaccine. So we haven't seen some of the other vaccines which we believe will be more efficacious. So I think overall, um, it's very promising that the vaccine that we currently have works against the UK variant, and, and that's fortuitous, considering Julie's data showing how big the UK variant is here. And so it does suggest that everyone should get vaccinated. But the problem is these other variants, as, as Ben brought up, is if other variants take over, how good will the vaccine be? And the answer to that at the moment is that people are now testing um, vaccines based on other variants. And clinical trials have just started on those now, in particular using the South Africa variants. In addition, there are booster doses being evaluated as well. I'm sure we'll talk about this later on. Um, a lot's happening. Um, the clinical trials have come a long way. They are still the gold standard of what we need to understand if a vaccine is going to work. As much as we have some very good laboratory data, 
there's no substitute at the current time for doing clinical studies. And I'm really very grateful to all the volunteers who agree to participate in these studies. Without these volunteers, we would have no data on these vaccines. And a big thank you to those people. Thank you, Alison. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barrett, for giving us that great perspective on the vaccines and the history where we started and, and where we are now. And um, I'd like to move on to uh, with Dr. Kumar and talk about uh, uh, Zoetis. Uh, in Zoetis is an animal health company. What was the motivation for developing a COVID vaccine? Uh, are companion animals at risk for developing COVID? And how are the animal vaccines different from the vaccines that are being developed for, uh, for people? Well, thank you uh, for, uh, for this invitation. I'm uh, glad to be here with uh, such distinguished guests. Uh, I have to say that uh, as an animal health company, our purpose really to make sure that we advance the care for animals and humankind. And uh, we have, uh, for those of you who don't know Zoetis, we are a spin-off of Pfizer. Uh, so basically we used to be part of Pfizer, now we are independent. Uh, our motivation, as I, I said, was uh, really looking to see if, if this uh, virus would spill over into the animal population. And uh, last February, when we heard of the first case of uh, a dog in Hong Kong, we immediately uh, decided to work on a program for cats and dogs. So we started our, our program and we started working uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the virus to see what we could do. And uh, uh, we found out quickly that uh, the USDA, which regulates or governs our products and uh, licenses, uh, did not feel that it was important uh, enough or clinically significant yet in uh, cats and dogs, and they declined to offer a pathway to an approval. Uh, we decided to still continue work on the program, and we uh, we looked to see how best we could uh, we could uh, this, uh, we could make a vaccine. So, uh, being in the animal health space and uh, with the restrictions around moving. The, the virus, uh, we decided to go a, a, a subunit route. And so we, we looked at what we, we could do. So we decided to use the spike trimer and uh, express that in a, in a, uh, in a uh, cell line. And we, uh, we made sure there was for the right, uh, the, the right uh, adaptations and changes to make sure there was the prefusion state which we now know uh, uh, is uh, needed to have uh, excellent efficacy. I think we get like 14 to 15 times more of an antibody response when you have it in the prefusion state than, uh, and, uh, than uh, in the other way around. So we, we made this uh, subunit and uh, as, uh, as you know, we've had already many, many vaccines uh, for animals. And the key for us is really the knowledge of the adjuvants and uh, the adjuvants are key uh, in making sure that we get the best response in that species. So very quickly, we, we, uh, we, uh, we took the express protein and adjuvanted with, uh, with these, uh, with these uh, proprietary adjuvants for the, that are special for each species. And for, for those who uh, are, 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 are not aware, basically to make an effective vaccine that's inactivated, you really need a good carrier to give you that little uh, kick uh, as well as the antigen. Uh, we need to make sure that's safe as well as efficacious. So with, uh, with our knowledge, we basically uh, tried four different adjuvants, two for cats and two for dogs, and uh, quickly found out that uh, uh, we, we were able to decide on one of the adjuvants being superior to uh, to the other one in cats and also another one in dogs. And we, we did some initial studies where we could see uh, excellent efficacy uh, from the standpoint of antibody responses. We then uh, took those uh, uh, antibodies and also did a uh, serum or virus neutralization assay to make sure that we have those uh, antibodies that are neutralizing the virus. And so we had pretty good uh, good data uh, on that we have a, an efficacious vaccine. We, sent, we actually uh, presented this at the World One Health Congress in October. And those of you who are interested can go online to, to, look, to look at that data. Uh, and uh, as we were working towards this, uh, the, the USDA realized that uh, minks were getting 
seriously affected by the virus. And that actually in, in I think in Denmark, there was, a, there was a concern that the minks uh, caused some mutation that spilled back into the, the human population. So, so and as, as One Health, uh, we all know that uh, animals uh, are a significant source of zoonotic uh, diseases. And uh, so this, offer, this offered us an opportunity uh, and a pathway towards uh, getting an approval in the US. And so we uh, quickly pivoted our program towards a vaccine in mink. And uh, we have uh, already begun our trials in, in, in the mink uh, and uh, safety studies. And we are, uh, we are working towards getting an approval for the USDA. And we have a similar procedure like uh, emergency use authorization. We call, they call them conditional approvals, conditional license, where we don't necessarily have to have full package, uh, but uh, we will have uh, to show or demonstrate a reasonable expectation of efficacy and of course, safety uh, uh, in these animals. So while we're working in this space, uh, we were actually, I think uh, there were some press reports on this, uh, the New York Times and other places. And uh, as soon as they saw that, some of, the, uh, some of the zoos reached out to us and actually the San Diego Zoo, which had a problem and the primates reached out to us said, that would we be able to provide them some vaccines? And so basically uh, we looked at the best likely a vaccine among the four that we had that would be appropriate for primates. And we sent them uh, some vaccine, which they have now used and uh, have found, found them to be safe and, uh, and have a reasonable antibody response. So this was then, of course, uh, they published that or I mean, the news reports came out and we've had multiple requests since then from zoos and other places. Uh, however, we are governed by the USDA and we have to make sure we request permission from them to provide them uh, as, as these would be off-label use and uh, as used as an experimental vaccine. So while we are working towards a, a, a regular approval in mink, we are also uh, helping out as we can and we are able to in the other animals. So, so clearly uh, we feel there is a need for animal vaccines. And while we don't feel it's a significant issue yet in companion animals, we know the viruses change as we already heard, they mutate and uh, it's, uh, it may be that they would mutate and become much more uh, adapted to companion animals and, and other animals. And uh, just to be certain that uh, if that were to happen, uh, Zoetis will be ready uh, with the vaccine. So I'll stop right there and uh, just uh, maybe move to the next slide, just give you a graphic about uh, what a company does. And, uh, and really uh, we are all uh, uh, in many places in the world as far as R&D sites and our people. And so uh, uh, I, I will look forward to the panel discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mahesh, for giving us that uh, insight into the animal vaccines and the perspective and how that relates to, uh, to the human vaccines. And um, I, I think now we're going to enter a, a session where we uh, have a general discussion between, uh, between the panelists. And uh, I'm going to turn this part over to you, Jerry. Sure, I have a burning question. So, um, uh, and, and it, it kind of uh, actually came directly from um, Ben's uh, presentation and actually uh, a, a comment that Jennifer made too. And so, Ben, one of your slides actually, you, you know, we're talking about what are really the Brazos Valley uh, um, variants and some of the uh, work that you've been doing in sequencing um, here in Brazos Valley in, on the Texas A&M campus. And, and there was a recent uh, media publication about that. And I think some scientific publications are underway as well and gene sequences are you know, put up into the, the appropriate um, web um, for other scientists to start analyzing. But could you unpack that a little bit? What, uh, what you, uh, this new variant that you've you've uh, identified and what that may mean, what's the significance from a virologist perspective? It's a lot easier to answer. What's the significance from a virologist perspective compared to public health or anything else? So <laughs> thank you for keeping my question. <laughs> um, so what I think is interesting about BV1, which is uh, the first one we pulled out, is that it is starting with all of the adaptations that you would find in the UK variant. 
These are the ones that presumably make the UK variant grow to higher levels in people and uh, generally spread faster than any of the other variants. There was some initial um, reporting that the UK variant might cause more disease but since then, there have been two more papers that said that maybe not, or they were a little smaller. So we're not so sure about that, I think. But you take that sort of chassis, and then we're putting on an extra mutation, which is one that is known to uh, the FDA and uh, various labs around the world as a mutation that makes the virus resistant to certain antibodies. Uh, some of these would be the antibodies you'd have after vaccination. Some of them are antibodies that you would get after, um, uh, you know, as a therapy in a hospital. So I think that's the significant thing, but there are also two other interesting variants there. One is kind of a combination of a local strain with most of the UK uh, spike in it. And the other one is a uh, different sort of local strain but with an extra mutation at the other side of um, where it would stick to the host cell. And that one may have similar effects to what we see with the UK variant. It's just too early to tell. There's a lot of science that still has to happen before we can do anything sensible with these, I would say. And, and, and Jennifer, uh, hearing that, and I know it's very early to really tell, but from a public health perspective, um, does this give you any you know, more reason to be concerned or not? Um, and, and does it have implications for the systems that we're putting in place to uh, up our surveillance and sequencing um, in Texas? It absolutely does. And I, I've shared some of my thoughts uh, with Ben already because the idea of, of um, these novel mutations, these emerging variants occurring in a college population um, is, is frightening to me because it's a population that we have not had a chance to really fully vaccinate yet. And there's some evidence that they're a little more resistant to vaccines with good reason. Like they're not um, having the severity of illness that older populations are. And, and the other thing that we know about them is that they are perfectly capable of getting infected and transmitting to other people. They just might not suffer all the severe effects. But there was an MMWR published back in the fall that showed that these younger adult populations would get infected. And then a couple of weeks later, we would see a peak in older populations. And so that these younger populations are the ones um, that, that are transmitting to older populations who are more at risk. And so I think that kind of um, double whammy of, you know, the, this is a population that's mixing, um, that is not, does not have good vaccine coverage and then can transmit it to other ones um, concerns concerns us a lot. Um, and like you mentioned, it, it just um, increases the need for strong uh, genomic surveillance uh, moving forward, both for COVID-19, but for the, <laughs> the next emerging pathogen uh, pandemic, or even some of the ones that, that we just deal with all the time, uh, like foodborne illnesses or something. But, you know, for um, COVID-19 in particular, as we still try to get our population some level of immunity, we're going to have to know what's emerging in our communities. And Texas is a challenging place. We've got a huge uh, area. Um, we're a big state. We've got a, a variety of different um, um, geography and people groups. And, you know, um, it is just a diverse place. And so um, it really needs to be a surveillance system that gets good coverage for the entire state. And so we are working to develop partnerships. Dr. Parker, I, I mean, you're, you're involved in some of those discussions with us. So uh, we're working on it because I do think it's gonna be really important. Yes, thank you. I think one of the important things that I think uh, that's, that's really nice to see is we're already beginning to take those lessons observed in COVID and apply them for lessons learned to emerging in the next, <laughs> emerging infectious disease with pandemic potential because it is coming. And so I think it's, uh, uh, we, we are building those systems not only to respond now, but for the future and that's important. Um, Alan, I wanna kind of, kind of the same kind of question to you, you know, just based on this new variant that we've seen just here in College Station, um, does it, it, and again, it may be too early to tell, but what do you, what do you think the significance is for vaccine development, particularly, you know, the clinical efficacy going in, in the future. Yeah. So it, I, I think this is a bit like two sides of a coin. Um, I, I like to try and be optimistic. 
and my optimism is that the virus is mutating with the same mutations in multiple areas. Um, it's not it's not people moving it, it's just trying to evolve. Uh, so it can infect people, not kill them, and maintain its host. And my optimism is the virus, Ben won't like me saying this maybe, but I'm hoping the virus will actually settle down, if that's the right way of putting it, and get to a sequence that it's happy with. And then we can make a vaccine against that will work against all the different variants. That That's my hope. I think the other side of the coin is, um, the veterinary side of it, if the virus makes a jump back into another animal species, then all bets are off because it will it could adapt to a new cell receptor, not the ACE2 in humans, and then it jumps back into humans again, as we heard with the mink, and that would be a, a real major, major problem. I believe that Texas can be in, in many ways the forefront of the United States. And as, as Jennifer said, we have a very diverse population. It probably represents 10% of the population in the US. It's a really great opportunities to really identify um, how the country as a whole is gonna, going to proceed. And, and as Ben's elegant sequencing shows, we're getting the mutations found in other states. And I really think there's some really big opportunities here to use this information in terms of planning on, on how to move forward. Thanks, thanks, Alan. And, and uh, Dr. Kumar, I'm gonna kind of go to you to also with the same question. And, and I'm gonna have to ask you first to perhaps uh, take off your Zoetis hat a little bit and, and, um, and, and think about what this may mean just from the vaccine industry uh, and how the vaccine industry is going to be able to flex and respond um, to the new variant, the variants that we already know, but the variants that we don't even know that have and may emerge in, in the future. And again, um, both animals and, and human vaccines. So you know, more broadly, the vaccine industry and how we'll be able to respond to flex. Sure. I think uh, one the question we always face is uh, what what cadence do we update a vaccine, right? I mean, flu, we know the WHO figures out a few strains and every year they tell you what it is and then you make the vaccine and you provide it for that next season. Sometimes you miss it because it's already, it's predicting what might happen eight months beforehand. So it's similarly, it, this is a challenge, right? If you think about even the current vaccine, you are not even keeping up with the demand out there. We trying as much as we can to make it. Uh, and the capacity is already fully loaded. Not only is it uh, affecting the capacity for production in the human space, the reagents and materials are impacting other industries as well. So people who are in the labs and research will already know you can't get certain filters, you can't get certain things. So, so all kinds of things are being impacted. So, so it is really difficult to predict when do we pivot to start making or producing the next construct in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. We can certainly make a construct and make a candidate vaccine very quickly. However, we need to ramp up the production. That's going to take time and effort, and it's going to take away the current vaccine uh, that's being made, right? There's an opportunity cost here. You move into something else. What are you going to do for the vaccine that's already being made? If I look at uh, what we do in the animal side, coronavirus vaccines are not new for animals, right? There's multiple coronavirus vaccines we have. Just looking at even the avian species, infectious bronchitis has been around for years and years. I think one of the first vaccines ever made in chickens was an infectious bronchitis vaccine. And if you look at, if you look at, that, if you look at that vaccine, we still use one of the strains called Massachusetts strain in all the vaccines today. So it's very dominant and still is very effective. However, we supplement that from time to time with variants, uh, variants there. So as, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, was mentioned earlier, it's, it, it'll be nice to find what the dominant strain is in the SARS-CoV space and use that as a, as a, as a uh, centerpiece and perhaps reflect on what we will supplement that from time to time. So this is, this is difficult to know at the moment. We're all learning. And again, 
we are going at breakneck speed trying to produce the doses needed to protect what we have today, right? So it's a challenge, but I think we are looking and uh, in the data that we have to see not just a phylogenetic analysis to see how varying, how different they are, but how well they protect the protector types, so to call. So we, as we call it sometimes to say, what vaccines are not able to protect against the variants and would that be the one we need to supplement? And uh, as uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier, not all those variants are really dominant either. So, so we, hope, uh, we hope that they do reach a, a kind of equilibrium in the, in the population, as, as mentioned earlier, that they, they don't want to kill your host and then not have any place to survive. So hopefully they'll reach a balance there. But clearly we are watching this space, even in the animal space, and I'm sure the human health companies as well, to see at what point do we start ramping up production in a meaningful way. Yeah, you know, I'm going to call an audible a little bit here. We've talked, you know, talking a little bit about manufacturing, clinical, but, and we we know and hear a lot about the supply chains for the human vaccine and industry. Are, are those supply chains uh, more intact in the animal uh, vaccine industry, or are you going to be stretched there too? We are actually. In fact, uh, we've had to convince the government authorities that we also are considered essential and don't, uh, because we have been uh, in competition with the human health companies as well from not just from uh, your, your manufacturing uh, equipment uh, and, and, but media and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, it, there is a, there's competition, but at the moment uh, we've not found it to be uh, significant, but there is certainly uh, impact. Okay, thank you. Uh, Allison, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, we have a few questions to offer the panel, and these were uh, synthesis of questions we got over the last couple of weeks that were submitted um, uh, during registration. And I'll just offer these to the panel uh, as a group. Uh, the first one uh, surrounds the, the UK strategy uh, for, for actually vaccination. They're using a very different strategy from ours in that they're aiming to ensure that at least 70% of the population gets the first shot and they're delaying the booster dose. Whereas our approach focuses on an FDA approved strategy in which complete vaccination is prioritized. So could you comment on what might be the pros and cons of both of these strategies and which one of these is better suited to ensure that we don't get more new variants? And, uh, <laughs> I think that's a great Dr. Barrett question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. I thought my, my good, oh, my, my, you know, I thought, uh, my God, that's the first question. It's pretty loaded. <laughs> <laughs> you should trim that one down, huh? <laughs> I, I, these are really very difficult questions to answer, and we're getting in, into into politics rather than public health, and and. I'm not sure that's what the Bush Institute's to do. That's my kickback to you, Jerry. Um, I, I, I think the FDA has been very clear that they want to follow the regimen based on the clinical trials. The clinical trials were given as the two doses three to four weeks apart, and that's what they expect the vaccines to be given. Whereas the UK, I think, offered a more um, fluid approach, should we say, to, to immunization. Um, in the end analysis, we know that after the first dose of vaccine, a very high proportion of people get um, apparently protected. And I'm going to use those words carefully um, because we don't have this corollary protection I said earlier. So it's all based on clinical data. And there's some very elegant work done by the CDC and MMWR showing that um, healthcare workers at eight, eight states, if I remember correctly, that after one dose of vaccine, you had up to 80% of people were protected from infection. It was very impressive. And the second dose pushed it up to that 95%. I think that's very promising um, moving forward. Um, I like to think that the FDA has picked the right route for us because it's based on the clinical trials. Um, the data in the United Kingdom was mostly based on AstraZeneca, from what I can make out, and they've done a variety of trials that have been done with different spacing between the first and second dose. 
and I, and I think there's a lot more to learn about that as we go along. Um, however, that's second guessing, and I, and I believe, um, even though I'm British and I, I live in America, that I, I think the FDA's way of doing it was, was the appropriate way based on the design of the clinical trials. Okay. I'm American, trained in Britain. I'd probably go the other way. I like that the UK are trying to hit this thing hard and early. And yeah, again, I think it is a matter of philosophy and guesswork and yeah, at least as much politics as public health at this yeah. point. Yeah. So as, as Ben sort of indicates, one of the pluses in the UK was they, I'm not going to say they took the gamble, but they their plans were based around that the first dose of vaccine would immunize you and then you'll be boosted by the, the wild type infection afterwards. And that's been shown that if you have um, wild type infection, then get a one dose of vaccine, you get a similar inf um, immunity to having two doses of vaccine. So it's probably correct, but I think the amount of data supporting that when it was actually implemented, maybe not as good as what we have in, in the United States. Okay, thank you. Thank you, panel. Are there more, uh, more comments on that? I just want to say that uh, based on some of the vaccine stuff we've done, you know, it's when you have a brand new disease, when you try to make a uh, develop a vaccine, is you always bet on two shots because you know that if the first one, you're never sure what the right level is. So by giving a two shot regimen, you're almost uh, guaranteeing a good efficacious response, right? So I think if you were to, if you were to say, okay, why would a Pfizer or a Moderna or anybody went to two shots? as opposed to one shot, it's just the way I would have done it. I mean, if I were in that space, I want to ensure success, I would go with two shots. I'm sure in the future, perhaps they will have data that might support a single dose. But I mean, this when you're starting off from scratch and you don't know what to do and it's emergency use, I think that's something to be done. I think the bigger problem is really vaccine hesitancy rather than the really the single or double dose, in my opinion. Okay, uh, yeah. Jennifer? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, I think from the public health perspective, you know, we do deal with a lot of vaccine hesitancy. And one of the ways that we've been able to do it, deal with it, um, even with these just authorized vaccines is to convince people, listen, like there are clinical trials, it's going through the same steps, we're following, uh, you know, we'll implement it just like the clinical trials did so that we can say, yeah, the, the efficacy and safety um, data should be, um, uh, that you should be able to extrapolate it to the population. And I think that by changing that, there's some challenges with messaging that for sure, um, beyond just the uncertainty of what um, uh, the, the true efficacy is after, um, if you change um, the, the dose or the interval of those vaccines. Um, I did have a question though uh, that I thought I would ask because I have heard uh, theoretically that having um, somebody who's partially immunized and then um, who becomes infected that they uh, could have like this additional pressure to develop uh, mutations um, and to, for emergent variants. And so is there any, I'll ask the virologists in the, on the panel if they think that that's a reasonable uh, uh, argument or no. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not of the opinion that vaccination derives mutation directly but it is natural selection that drives mutation and it's natural selection plus time, I think. I see where the argument's coming from though, but I think the bigger picture is that if you have some immunity, you knock out most of the virus and then, yeah, if a little bit of it mutates a little, then I think that's an easier problem to clean up than if you have more virus mutating in more different ways. But again, I think this is philosophy rather than real hard science. And I don't know of a good paper that I could you know, point to and say, yeah, this is why it's right. I mean, I mean, just from the standpoint of seeing what happened, right? Even though there weren't really that many vaccines in people, but we were seeing mutations anyway. So the point was, 
I don't think the vaccines drove those mutations rather than a natural cadence of mutations that were happening. So yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm a vaccine person, so I would say no, but uh, obviously data needs to be generated. I think if I can add, I think um, I'd agree with what's been said by the other speakers um, that the evidence so far is it's the people who are not vaccinated who are the ones that are spreading the virus around because they don't have much of an immune response, um, if any, when they get infected. And so the virus is looking to be, I said earlier, I think the virus doesn't want to kill people. It wants to settle down and just infect people and just keep going. And so it's in the best interest of the virus. And that's philosophical and scientific, I guess. But that, that's what I, I believe the virus is trying to do. Um, and so that's why I hope we'll get to this convergent evolution where we'll have uh, a vaccine at work against the majority of the strains, as uh, Mahesh said. Um, I hope I'm right. I hope I'm not wrong. Um, but, I, but I do feel the more people get vaccinated, the more we can get rid of the variants. I, I definitely share that hope. I'm just not sure that you can trust a thing without a brain to actually follow a sensible plan, but I sure hope we can. <laughs> well, I would agree that viruses are far brighter than humans. I agree about that. Um, and But if you look at the other coronaviruses, it's going down the same route as, as we've heard for the veterinary and the animal world, that it's looking like it just wants to infect people and not cause serious disease. The serious disease is a byproduct. It doesn't intend to do that. And I, and I think that's, I'm trying to be optimistic here, that there's not going to be huge numbers of variants causing big problems in the future. Um, but there'll be likely some variants that will arise in small pockets, maybe Brazos Valley, that will cause big problems. Um, but it will be for unexpected reasons, because the virus would like to have a laugh at us when we think we know what we're doing. Thank you for what what I'm hearing here is that we're we're looking to to uh, vaccination to knock down the capacity to create new variants, and that uh, that even a partial vaccination is is uh, is knocking that down significantly. And uh, are there any other comments, or uh, shall we move on to our next uh, next question? Uh, um, Dr. Kumar, a question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so we've seen a few cases now of viruses coming out of animals like mink, and they have a lot of mutations as if they're under extraordinary selective pressure or they're doing something fundamentally different there. Do you have a sense of what's going on and if this is coincidence that we've seen a couple that are like this or if this is something that is more likely to continue? Well, we only know of uh the mink that have uh, had this happen to. I don't know of any other species that's happened, at least from a corona SARS-CoV-2 standpoint. Many, we don't know for certain why, but I think the, the situation is that when you have uh, a certain species that's maybe more susceptible or more receptive to the virus, and maybe the replication cycle in that species uh, maybe supports the, the changes more quickly than others based on the receptors, it could happen. So I, I think I just take it from that standpoint that, okay, it just so happened that in mink, this virus was able to change. What we really don't know is, did it really change that much or did it really happen through multiple uh, you know uh, human mink interactions? Because nobody knows exactly when it spilled over from a human into the mink and then back to the human, right? So we don't know that, just we know that this is what happened. And uh, essentially uh, that, that we heard that, but we knew clearly that it was very easy for the virus to slip from the human to the mink, because this happened in the Netherlands, in Spain and multiple countries in the United States as well. So, so it was not, uh, not unheard of that, okay, so there's something that in the mink receptor that allowed the virus to quickly jump there, could there be other things there that could have helped uh, help the virus replicate more, and maybe perhaps uh, that changed uh, changed the uh, changed uh, the mutation cadence? Is there any evidence there's increased virulence by moving into the mink uh, as it transmits back to humans? I think what we know is that it it was a variant. I don't believe it was any more virulent uh, from what we've heard. 
I know we are we are actually uh, carrying on companion animal surveillance here in College Station uh, and looking at uh, at dogs of individuals who have had uh, had COVID in the house. I don't know if you have any insight into that, Ben. Uh, yeah, uh, the doctors Hamer and Hamer have been doing this, and it looks like the animals have pretty much the same UK variant as the uh, humans that gave it to them. So I think that's what you would expect, but I think they caught it really soon after the first transmission. So what you were saying there about let it bounce back and forth a few times and who knows what you'll get out. I think there's something to that. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, we have had several questions about uh, surrounding the J&J &J vaccine pause and uh, questions about comments about accelerated development timelines and and how concerned should we be about vaccine safety? I thought we were talking about virus variants. <laughs> said, you okay, well, we can me. move on at this point. <laughs> um, um, I guess it's vaccines again for humans. So I guess that's probably me. Um, I, I think humans have this expectation that every vaccine is going to be 100% effective and 150% safe. And there is no such vaccine as that. And um, without being disrespectful to my colleagues in the media, um, bad news is good news and good news is bad news. And so we see the focus a lot on um, a very low number of adverse events get a lot of highlights, whereas we don't tend to talk about the success stories of how good vaccination has been. And, and I, I believe that the data we that's been produced um, in the last few months is phenomenal. To, to have vaccines that have 95% efficacy, I don't think anyone would have predicted that. And I can remember the WHO, FDA and other regulators 40 to 60% was the expectation. And so uh, it's really been a success story. And uh, unfortunately, we, we tend to focus on the adverse events. And um, it is very unfortunate, these adverse events, but they're in a very small number of people rel relative to the number of people are immunized. And um, it, although it's unfortunate, it's worth saying that the vaccines protect a lot more people and stop them having severe COVID. I think we have to remember that. There's a lot of data, I think, to be gained understanding what the mechanism of what is happening. I thought it was all related to brain blood vessels, but now other blood vessels and other parts of the body are also being associated with this phenomenon as well. Um, and so there's some strange things here that we don't understand. Um, low platelet counts are associated with it as well. Um, I believe the regulators have taken the right view to it, that the benefits far outweigh um, the risks of having these conditions. Although to me, um, the, the, the fact that nearly all the cases have been in women is a major concern. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that really does need to be investigated more. Why is there a, that's apparent sex link um, to this condition? And also the other condition, the anaphylaxis, which people have tended to accept as compared to the thrombosis problem. But again, that's mostly seen in women too. And I, and I think there's something we're missing in a research venue that really needs investigation more than what we're doing at the current time. But I would say overall, the benefits of the vaccination far outweigh the, the risks. Yeah, Ellen, this, the, I agree. I'll take a moderator for I'm going to jump, jump in here too. And I, I, I totally agree with you. And, and perhaps it's it just kind of a reflection. If we rewind the clock a little bit, we, we as scientists, public health authorities, policy folks, just we haven't we haven't done a good enough job, I think, in communication. You know what 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 is what is efficacy and safety of vaccines, and and it doesn't mean a hundred percent, but we it's just part of I think the continuing education and communication that we, we've got to be better in how to how to ed, educate everybody about uh, about vaccines um and it kind of goes back to also maybe a comment jennifer made earlier about 
uh, should we have followed the UK or stick with the FDA uh, and so forth? Um, and we can debate it on both sides. There's, there's merit on both sides of those decisions. But I also agree with Jennifer's comment earlier about it's best that we follow the data, the clinical trials that we had at hand, because uh, that also, uh, if we had, that would have been another communication challenge. Just, you know, would have would have maybe um, just set back some of our effort a little bit. But anyway, I, I totally agree with you. And I just, uh, it's, it's one of our lessons observed that we're going to have to apply to a lesson learned going forward. I think I was just going to say that, the, you know, it's unprecedented, the number of doses of vaccine given in such a short time. I don't know if there's any, any precedent to that in the past. I mean, uh, millions of doses have been made, maybe even more. So in such a short period of time, and to think of a handful of cases where we've had some issues is really remarkable. And I have to say that the industry really stepped up to get something so quickly to market. And while it's not fully tested, certainly they had done enough tests uh, and, uh, in a, in, in to show safety and efficacy. And really think about it, you know, how many millions of doses have been given in, in such a short time? It's a, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's extraordinary, and could go co go down as certainly the uh, most significant public health uh, achievement, success, and 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 vaccine success of our lifetime. And I think another. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go, 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 a go. good thing to emphasize is just that you know our, it, this is a testament to the safety mechanisms of vaccine um, in our country that you know even though these real these uh, adverse events are happening only rarely we're able to catch them up, catch them you know with the surveillance system that's in place um, and so it's really um, I, I think it's really encouraging that we are having this rapid rollout and that we can still find those safety signals um, even just using theirs and and uh, perhaps be safe, some of the other uh, safety monitoring uh, systems in place, but they're there and they're working. And, and there's been another, a new amazing outcome of this in that we have a brand new platform for vaccines and, and that platform uh, lends itself uh, to rapid updates uh, beyond what we've been able to do before. So I think, uh, you know, there, there are some uh, silver linings to, to dealing with this really um, dramatic uh, pandemic. Listen, if I could just take a moment to turn something around, which I think is the biggest worry for COVID vaccination, and this is, follows on from Mahesh's comments earlier, that we've turned over nearly all our manufacturing capability to making COVID vaccines. And there are now becoming bigger and bigger gaps in our normal childhood vaccine programs around the world. And if you look at Ebola, what it did in Africa, um, and it essentially stopped all the immunization campaigns, and the numbers of cases of measles and other childhood diseases have really shot up. And unfortunately, I think we may see a similar thing around the world now. Um, we have not kept up with immunization practices. We can't manufacture enough of these vaccines because we turn facilities over to, to COVID vaccines. And that's a real worry, I think, moving forward, um, what's gonna happen to the other vaccines and, and maintaining immunization rates, um, particularly amongst children. You know, and, and Alan, I'll, again, I'll take the moderator prerogative, but you know, just another data because you know, I think there's several, several that you know also believe for COVID and SARS-CoV, we, we got to be thinking about how to provide a back COVID vaccine to the world and global immunization. So global to do that means we have to produce 14 billion doses of COVID vaccine, and and today we only produce about five billion doses around the world of all vaccines other than COVID. So, you know, the capacity and supply chains, you know, you bring up another good point, you know, that we're gonna have to, we have some huge challenges in front of us, COVID and non, and, and other diseases, vaccine preventable diseases. At this point, uh, Jerry, do we have time for some questions? I think uh, Erica has, has looked through questions that have come through from the audience and uh, Erica Walker, who's a key member of our One Health uh, program, uh, has looked through these and picked out some of the questions uh, uh, to offer to the uh, panel. I'll turn it over to you, Erica. Dr. Effect, um, and Jerry too, if you have some questions that have come directly to you that you need to get answered, feel free to jump in. Um, quite a few okay. of these questions have been um, answered. So I'm gonna 
um, pick out some of the ones that uh, may not have been answered as clearly. Uh, one is a, a question to Ben. How are you seeing um, the UK and BV variants affect on age groups? Um, being information has indicated that the UK variant is taking a stronger hold on a younger age group. Anecdotally, at least, and in some small studies, I have seen that there is a little bit of evidence for the association with the UK variant with uh, younger ages. I suspect, though, that what we're seeing here is actually a byproduct. The UK variant grows to higher levels inside everybody who gets it. And I think a lot of those kids were getting infected before, but were not being detected because they were just barely underneath wherever the bar is for detection. That is more a hunch than actual science, but in my mind, that's how I'm explaining it to myself at the moment. And maybe staying in, in this theme of younger populations, just because we're there, there was another question here saying, given many of the unknowns surrounding, um, I think it's the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children uh, related to COVID, is anyone seeing any relationships or correlations regarding variants and increased risk of developing this, or is data still too early uh, of a stage to start seeing these connections? Can I say something about the vaccination? I think it's important at this point to introduce the fact that a lot of studies are being done now to giving vaccines to younger children. Um, Pfizer have completed their clinical trials from ages 12 um, to 15 and have requested the FDA to give them um, authorization to give the Pfizer vaccine to everybody else age 12 and over. And the other vaccine candidates are also being starting to be evaluated in children. I believe the way the clinical trials are going at the moment and the relative ease at recruiting children, I think we'll probably see COVID vaccines available for children um, sometime during the summer for most ages, um, which will probably give us an opportunity to get children back to school properly in the fall. At least that's my hope. And I, and I think I like being positive about things. Um, and I think, I, I believe that's gonna be a positive attribute of where we're going now with the clinical trials that we'll be able to give the, the vaccines to younger children. Are there uh, others that want to weigh in on that? Uh, do you have some other questions, Erica? I do. Um, so uh, on the One Health side of things, when we were talking about uh, animals, are, are we doing any uh, biosurveillance on animals besides minks, dogs, and cats? Yes, we are. Uh, we are. We have several networks uh, already that we do normal surveillance as part of an emerging infectious disease program. And so we have uh, taken on, uh, of course, COVID as uh, another one we look for, and we are watching the space uh, and really relying on on the diagnostic labs and reference labs that get the samples. And so really what's being reported. So whatever comes in, uh, we, we, we look at it. Uh, and also uh, our, our field force that's out there to see anything unusual and other things that we look at. Uh, so we are monitoring the situation. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, obviously the, the ones that we have most, uh, most uh, uh, samples we're looking at are cats, dogs, and, 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 uh, and some other animals like uh, mustelids, like uh, mink and ferrets and otters and stuff like that, yes. I'd, I'd like to ask a question to the panel. As long as there are outbreaks around the world, can we vaccinate here in the US and relax, not worry about it? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I think uh, what we have to say is first, we need to make sure everybody gets vaccinated and encourage that, that to happen. I also feel like, uh, especially healthcare workers, you know, I know that uh, this is a difficult thing to force people to get vaccinated, but you know, they, they, they think it'd be helpful if they're all vaccinated as well. Uh, can we relax? I mean, I, I don't know. You know I, I think it's one of those things where unless we have a, a significant population that's protected one way or the other, whether they're exposed to the virus or whether the vaccine, 
I think it's going to be difficult to, to convince that. That's a lot more elegant. My answer was just going to be no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We have a, a lot of pockets of virus around the world and certain areas are really uh, expanding rapidly with the with the new virus. And I wonder what it will take, uh, if it's gonna take a global effort. Uh, if we, we need to participate in COVAX to actually uh, quench this around the world. You know, there's so much misinformation out there and I can't tell you how many things I see and read about, you know, you drink this, you'll be fine, you do that. And so uh, I see uh, so many cases where you just so many different, uh, uh, you know, incidents and outbreaks out there. And I keep thinking to myself, you know, how much of this is caused from uh, misinformation, you know? So it's very, very difficult, even for an educated person to sift through what's out there to, to, to recognize and and believe in something. And so really we have a job to do besides just uh, uh, just what we do in R&D to really uh, educate and uh, spread the word on what we do and how, how effective they are. Any other comments? I think um, Aish made a very good uh, point earlier about the problem of the raw materials and the various equipment for doing manufacturing, the filters, et cetera, has become a big issue. Um, somehow we all have to get together and be able to, to share the resources that we need um, to be able to immunize everybody in the world. This is a worldwide problem. We can't just see the United States as, as one entity because it means that people won't be able to travel internationally. That's, that's where we'll be. And so we have to look outside uh, the problem is, do we have enough capability to manufacture all the vaccines that we need? We heard earlier about the problems of getting 16 billion doses of, uh, of COVID vaccine just for this year without booster doses being considered. And then we've also got the, all the other childhood vaccines. And there are, what, 53 vaccines used around the world at the moment for humans. Um, that we need to maintain those manufacturing capabilities to make sure we maintain immune responses. And so there's a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, COVAX, I think, is the real way to go forward to do that. But it's the real question of how you do the implementation, how you have enough seed material that you can make all the stocks in, uh, that can be used to make the lots in different facilities around the world. It's a huge amount of um, implementation needed to do this that is not as straightforward as it sounds, um, just to say, oh, I'm going to manufacture a vaccine. And, that, and that's... I think someone we're learning from the emergent problem um, that if you don't have an appropriate infrastructure for doing the manufacturing, then you've got real big problems. And, and that's something I think people on the whole haven't taken on board so far, but are starting to realize now that is a major problem moving forward. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I think we're get, coming close to the end of our, our time. And I'd like to pose a final question to each one of the, of the panelists. We're going to have a lightning answer here. Uh, I'd like to ask Jennifer first, uh, are we in a race against time, Jennifer? Yes, from my perspective, we are in a race against time and that we need to get our population vaccinated. Uh, ben, are we in a race against time? Yeah, but it's kind of an egg and spoon race. And so I'm a guy who's like glass half full, but please stop dropping the glass on the floor or it won't stay that way. <laughs> Alan, are we in a race against time? Yes, and I think it's about booster doses. We're all assuming that everyone's been immunized. I saw someone last night and they said, oh, it's over now, I got immunized, it's done. And that I think is a bit naive. Um, we are gonna have to need booster doses moving forward and the real challenge is, can we make those booster doses and when do we need them? Mahesh, are we in a race against time? I certainly are, Allison. I think uh, the key thing is we need to make sure everybody in the race finishes the race. You know, we need to make sure everybody's vaccinated. It's not the winners uh, and the losers. Everybody needs to cross the finish lines. I, I'm going to turn it over now. Thank you, everyone. Turn this over to Jerry uh, to sort of pull everything together here. Sure. And I'm going to ask one more lightning round uh, question. 
And I think everybody's, uh, this is gonna you know, make us think of here a little bit, uh, but everybody's tired of the pandemic. We have pandemic fatigue, but do you see us getting through this pandemic and what will that look like? Jennifer. Oh man, can I not pass? Um, <laughs> so I think um, it's showing some really hopeful signs. And I, I mean, I think that there is a potential where we can get vaccinated and with the boosters be able to manage this like we do some other infectious diseases. But I think that's where that time component comes in. I don't want to miss our chance and then have to make up ground later on. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, yes, I think we can do it. I think we eventually will do it. I think once we've done it, we'll look back and say, this is awesome, but why did we make it so hard on ourselves all the way along? Um, yeah, and I don't know if we'll learn anything, but I, I can always hope, yeah. Alan. I agree. I think in five years, we'll look back and wonder what we went through, but I, I feel strongly that we can get through this. Dr. Kumar. Absolutely, 100% will get through this. All right, very good. Well, let me just try to provide, we're, we're in time now. And, and first, I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to join us. I wanna I want say a special thanks to our panelists. I think you can tell we certainly, uh, I, I've learned a lot by our panelists and I appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and, and talk to the community, both public, scientists, faculty, and, um, and policy policymakers. So thank you very much. And thank everybody for joining. I think some key messages are, we are, in a, we are in a race against time. And I think it comes down to all of us. All of us have a component and a role to play in this race against time. Public health measures are still important. I know we're tired of it, you know, but, but uh, they, they work. And so uh, even as we're rolling out the vaccine, the basic public health measures are, are important. So we need still need to take that in, in consideration. We need to continue to accelerate our immunization programs and, and find better ways so that we can take vaccine to the underserved communities and harder to reach communities. We've done a great job of getting so many millions of people immunized in the United States and in our own state of Texas, you know, but we're gonna take that next mile, that next step to take it to the harder to reach communities, both in urban areas and, and rural communities. Um, and we have to up, up our surveillance systems and which we're doing so that we can have a better understanding and situational awareness of, of the variants that are in communities right now that we may not have total situational awareness of and the new variants, the variants that are most likely sure to emerge. Um, but I think we need a dose of optimism, you know, in addition to that dose of vaccine. We need a dose of optimism as we continue to move forward. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, our, all of our panel, panelists unanimously uh, believe that we're gonna get through this. And we're gonna find our new normal, our new, new dynamic as I like to call it. So again, thanks everybody. Um, and there's a lot more questions. We'll do our best to try to answer some of these questions that people had. There were great questions that came in. I appreciate that. We'll do our best to put some um, uh, questions on the website with, with answers. So we're gonna sign off now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.